I'm very honored to be here. Uh, I left uh, Georgetown for many years. So glad back home here, give a report. <laughs> and uh, I'm so glad uh, my uh, study advisor and teacher, John, Father John Vetek here. So <laughs> as a return products, I can say something today to you and Georgetown. Thanks, Burke Center invite me. Everybody talks China, I'm Chinese, so I think I may have some things about China <coughs> to you more than others uh, this, up, this morning. And uh, talk religion or religion freedom. Uh, we want to see a big picture. U.S.-China relation is so important, as you know. As I say, there are four major issues between U.S.-China. Trading issue, Taiwan issue, secure issue, including non-proliferation and human rights. Among human rights, probably religion is the biggest one. <clears throat> However, U.S.-China religion relation is so good, but for the three of of four, uh, trading. Taiwan and uh, secure government can talk to government, can make a deal. Human rights is different. It's not something back and forth. It's always there because who paid attention on religion? It's not just the government. In this country, in the US, religion is some very, very important fundamental elements in the society with a long history, deep roots. So it's not simply this ministry talk to another departments. It's not simply <clears throat> an issue between officials. How can we see the religion or religion freedom? That is a different way to think or to look from both sides or either side. If we talk religion freedom, we have to think the country is different. In China, religion is not something here. That's the first thing you have to see. So the good things, as I say, is China has made a big progress recently, especially <clears throat> the later last year. Uh, the 17 Communist Party's Congress just uh, made a clear statement including changed uh, a few words on the uh, Communist Party's constitution. The result is try to <coughs> treat religion more positive. The attitude is much uh, positively than before. General Secretary Hu Jintao wants to religion to play a positive role in the promotion of economical and the social uh, development, which Comes Party never mentioned this before. It is first time for General Party Secretary mentioned this, and also it's first time for the Politburo, which is the highest decision maker group, to study religion, listen to two scholars who talk religion situation uh, on both uh, domestic and international. Such things <laughs> reported on the media publicly which means Chinese government and Communist Party paid high attention on religion. <clears throat> Not just because religion is a problem, but also government may think religion can play a positive role, as I said, in the society. However, religion does have some issues or problem. Many people use the words uh, religion's persecution. This, it's a very controversial issue or uh, words or terms in China. The Chinese government's position, I don't need to repeat here, but I just want to say it a little different. When we look at China or look the religion issue in China, we may need to put this issue under the big background. What means that when you think the China 20 years ago or 30 years ago, there there was no law on 
economy. Planning system is what we had before. Right now, we have a free market, we have a competition. Because of that, we have a law, we have a rule of law, which everyone feels good. <clears throat> that is the biggest change in China, or uh, progress in China. Because this kind of change, you think China is wonderful. Meanwhile, political reform is not as fast as uh, economic reform is uh, taking place. So when you think in uh, China, some things you think are uh, great, wonderful, some things you think, oh, maybe it's not as uh, economic reform. So religion is in a non-economic area. So if you think that, you have to think other things. Religion freedom, as a professor, Alan uh, Hurst mentioned, requires uh, freedom of uh, speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of association. If we changed all the things, maybe it's, not, it's too, too much at this time. So we have to think that uh, and make a plan, or the Chinese government may have uh, some kind of uh, consideration how to make a, a political reform as well as uh, economical reform simultaneously. So don't think things will be changed overnight, but don't think things will no change. So it's just a different way to think things <clears throat> in the political area, religion, r related to different issues, as I said, uh, association, uh, registration, and, uh, NGO, all these kind of issues. So if you think these things, you don't put religion as a single issue. <clears throat> That's what I want you to understand. You have to think the big environment, then think of religion. <clears throat> if we have a free market, we have a competition, then the free market and competition will require the law, the rules. The rule of law will be a natural or automatically becomes an uh, agenda for both government and the people. Because we haven't got that kind of uh, degree for religion. We don't have an open religion market as what you see here. We don't have a free denominations competition. We don't have all <laughs> kinds of uh, names, uh, religion organization or faith-based organization in China. We, on we only have uh, five government recognized religion. So the rule of law is something in the f future. We are looking for that or working on that. So we had uh, several conferences in the past uh, several years try to understand how to make <coughs> religion under the rule of law switch the management from uh, administration system or, or um, uh, uh, approach to the rule of law. That is a very positive, constructive way to think how to deal with the religion issue. <clears throat> but it takes a while. <laughs> so uh, religion is an issue, but uh, we are thinking that everything will be changed or improved. It takes a little while. It requires lots of other things, not just a single uh, uh, elements. My personal uh, comments or opinion uh, toward the American law, International Religions um, Act is, uh, US-China has lots of issues. Some kind of issues you can make a deal with China. Sometimes you cannot, uh, values or view is different. So it's hard to change other people's face. That's the first. But it never means you cannot talk. So the more dialogue, exchange, always good, always better. So I really want U.S. government and uh, people here to have a more engagement and exchange with Chinese government and people to have a better understanding for both why there is a difference. If you don't have a better understanding, never get a solution. <clears throat> Second, to 
have a dialogue with China, not just the government's job. Government has a government agenda. Government changes, Republicans or uh, Democrats change always, but the people no change, culture no change. Maybe it's a good way for more people engaged than just the government. Once things goes to government, it's more political than culture, than individuals. So whether you take a religion as a political issue or just a, a different culture, different tradition, as a uh, way for you to think. Regarding the government's dialogue with China, as I say, there is a big a technical problem. The technical problem based on the different structure of government. In the US, you have a State Department. There is an agency or office in charge religion freedom. That's good, so you are talking with some countries. However, the religion issues, religion affairs, is not a job for the Foreign Affairs Ministry. It is under <coughs> a State Authority of Religion Affairs, Sarah. Sarah doesn't care or doesn't in the position to take care of foreign affairs. So when you talk to China, who are you talking to? You are talking to the Foreign Affairs Ministry, or you are talking to the civil <coughs> office, which is a Religion Affairs Bureau. So it's different. If you are talking to the uh, legal system, it goes another direction. So there is no equal office here deal with religion. So first, you have to think, who should we talk? If you really don't have an equal partner to talk, this is a very difficult, frustrating issue. So first, you have to think, if you have a government dialogue, why you want to talk? You want to invite several groups sit together in one room? You want to talk separate? Each one has its focus. That's a different current structure. Without that kind of thinking, you may think, oh, nobody is, will be responsible for the issues you are talking to. After you are talking, who will be responsible for that? So that is a technical uh, problem, but there is a way to build mechanism for both governments to realize if this is a problem related to U.S.-China relations, how can we deal with that? U.S.-China relation is important. It's one of the most important relations in the whole world. Don't let one issue hurt all these this relations. So we need to think that instead of just say some things <coughs> simply. Another issue I want to say is for the U.S. government. Uh, I don't want to uh, criticize any government, including the U.S. government, but I have to be honest. Religion freedom requires a tolerance, so maybe you give me a little tolerance. U.S. government's policy sometimes emphasize religion freedom very much, sometimes not, uh, or maybe not as strong as uh, uh, sometimes. So uh, people get an uh, impression, oh, you government use religion freedom as a leverage for some uh, political purpose or some agendas. Maybe different uh, administration has a different agenda. Bush may emphasize much than others. So you don't really have a consistency. It's very inconsistent. So whether this is your commitment for your foundation for the freedom in this country, for your tradition, or it's just the, the one weapon or tool in your diplomatic work temporarily. So I don't want to say this is a very practical or utilitarian, <laughs> but sort of uh, that. People think, okay, U.S. is so smart. Sometimes uh, a lot of late <coughs> talk the human rights, including religion, religion freedom. Sometimes you have other issues. So let's make a deal. We buy 100 aircraft from Seattle. What about uh, the, you guys shut up? <laughs> on others. Don't make things like that, okay. Uh, 
okay. <laughs> I don't think the people are really serious think this is a, uh, some issues. It, uh, before the uh, United States established, there's, there was an issue of religion freedom. Since then, until today, what changed? What never changed? You should tell people this instead of make deal always. <clears throat> Religion freedom shouldn't serve for the political purpose or political agenda. That's what I mean. <clears throat> it's not something for uh, the government to make a uh, deal. <clears throat> uh, finally, I want to say for the Taiwan issue, <clears throat> for the trading issue, the government or uh, the, the military issue, secure issue, government can talk with government, but the religion, is really not that. Someone just mentioned you have to sensitively think the culture, the tradition. Once you go that way, you will think there are many differences in between US-China relations. Religion probably is one of the most difficult one. However, as long as you pay attention on that and increase dialogue, exchange, the difference will be uh, something less uh, dangerous than uh, some big deals. Otherwise, the small things can be a di uh, big one. I don't want to say any things jeopardize or hurt US-China relation. But if you only think that, so your uh, design may be different from uh, the result. Just think whether this can promote U.S.-China relation or hurt U.S.-China relation. As long as you think that, you will have a comprehensive picture about this instead of just a narrow thinking. Thank you. Thank you to our hosts. Thank you for invitation. Uh, my talk framed by statement of uh, Jose Casanova, who emphasized that Ukraine has the most pluralistic and most competitive religious market. And all what I need is just support. This says it's not because Professor Casanova is Huru for this whole generation of sociologists of religion, not because he speaks fluently Ukrainian, but he really has a right. Let me jump to 1998. Ten years ago, uh, Ukraine was a country which promptly uh, evolving from promising uh, new independent uh, state with impressive resources and good uh, U uh, European perspective into the country with one of the most corrupted government, which violated business, suppressed media, and persecuted journalists. Those time, Ukrainian government undermined, uh, not government, but whole state undermined uh, its own international authority, especially trust of Western partners. At the same time, apathy and disbelief in the very possibility in change were spread over the different strata of Ukrainian society. On the background of uh, deep disappointment in state institutions, manipulated media, all the same political parties and state-controlled trade unions, Churches appeared at, as a most trusted social institution. A trusted, reliable opinion poll shows that uh, in 2000-2007, the church remained the social institute enjoying the highest trust in society. The church is to a smaller or greater extent, church, not particular church, but church as a social institution. Uh, trusted uh, by nearly 60% of uh, 
of citizens, not trusted by nearly uh, 30%. For comparison, the trust in public organization in that time frame did not exceed 30%. Mistrust in them sometimes exceeded half of those polled. The presence of church in public space seemed to be more and more evident, at least in institutional level. The number of Ukrainians who declared themselves to be religious was increasing rather quickly and reached more than three-fourths of adults by the end of 1990s. The portion of people who attend church services regularly, more than uh, once a month, was about 20%, and this figure places Ukraine approximately into the middle of the Central Eastern European pyramid, behind Catholic Hungary, but ahead of Czech Republic, Russia, Belarus, Eastern Germany, Latvia, and Estonia. In spite of the fact that change in personal religious behavior has become a noticeable factor of the public life, various number of religious congregations became comparable to the number of all non-governmental uh, institutions. What is extremely important to our uh, topic and issue discussed, even in those time, when ruling regime brutally violated basic freedom and human rights, Ukraine had relatively decent standards in the sphere of religious freedom and enjoyed one of the most liberal church state legislation all over the post-Soviet space. There were at least four principal uh, reasons why all these years Ukraine has obtained a good mark for achievement in the realm of religious freedom from the US Department of State. And these reasons uh, are still active, uh, still effective and work in this sphere. Uh, the first reason is the religious configuration of Ukraine. Several centers of religious power exist in Ukraine. This fact prevents any, of, uh, any one of these power centers from dominating over religious minorities or from conducting repressive or even restrictive policy towards them. These power centers, I mean Orthodox churches, Greek Catholic churches, and large, one of the largest in all Europe uh, evangelical community, function as rivals, addressing their own sector of public opinion and their own corresponding circles of political elite. They create a kind of balance that prevents the establishment of religious institutions that would dominate supremely over others and which with, uh, with which one might identify the euro de facto uh, the Ukrainian nation. Additionally to uh, Professor Kasanova evaluation of Ukraine as the most pluralistic and competitive religious market market in Eastern Europe, it is necessary to admit that there is neither pure religious pluralism, nor non-aggression pact between great religious powers, but a quite fragile balance based on equal possibilities of parties. Pluralism, as it put on by George Weigel, doesn't simply happen. Genuine pluralism is built out of plurality when differences are debated rather than ignored, and a unity begins to be discerned. Indicatively, that in the re regions of absolute dominance of one of the party involved, religious freedom violation occurs much more frequently in comparison with zones that of strong religious diversity. The second reason is the absence of strict correlation between denominational and national identity, which also contributes to this establishment of religious monopoly. Religion is not a core element of uh, Ukrainian national myth. When we speak about the true Ukrainian, we do not mean the religious identity as we do when we speak about, let's say, Poles or Croatians or even Georgians. The Ukrainian project, which was uh, largely based 
on the intention of 19th century uh, Galicina thinkers who believed that the Western Ukraine should not be Polish, uh, Austrian, Russian, nor Moscow but instead part of a great Ukrainian nation, meant the deliberate abstraction of religious differences between Catholics and Orthodox believers. In his 1906 article, For a Father of Ukrainian Nationalism, Mikhail Hrushevsky warned the compatriots of the recurring danger of Serbs and Croats, religiously divided nations, which have arisen on the common ethnic base. And third reason of decent standards on religious freedom in Ukraine is that religious freedom in Ukraine never threatened the government's position as, for instance, the freedom of speech can. Respectively, the Ukrainian government had no reason to seek the destruction of religious freedom and religious human rights, to which, in addition, the United States is, was and is so sensitive. And the final reason, which is, in my opinion, very important, is the historically high level of tolerance uh, by Ukrainians toward other believers. I have not time to, to deliberate, to, uh, to develop this thesis, so just trust me. Uh, because it has solid, uh, solid uh, sociological uh, basis. The solidity of religious freedom was crucially challenged during the 2004 presidential campaign. Governmental candidate a uh, team applied rough political technologies, realized scenario of destabilization, and with convenience of acting president, who was guarantor of uh, uh, Ukrainian constitution and thus unity, directed the effort toward split of the nation along the regional, ethnic, and linguistic and religious lines. The split between Ukrainian East and West became due to politicians' efforts wider and deeper. Moreover, according to 2005 <coughs> opinion poll data, up to 10% of all Ukrainians experienced very sharp conflict with relatives and friends because of different political stance during the election. Next two years pro proved that authorities had no strategy of country consolidation. All of this caused additional knots of contradiction uh, between major uh, religious actors. Additionally, new administration made some not well weighed experiments with National Committee for Religious Matter. On January 2005, the president passed a decree which liquidated the National Committee on Religious Matters. However, despite the wording of the presidential decree, the National Committee on Religious Matters was actually not liquidated, but transformed into a respective department within the framework of uh, the Minister of Justice and later within National Committee on Nationalities and Religious Affairs. In the course of three years, two heads of this body were changed and recently, the third one took the office. One can presume that such change did not promote management succession and reliability of governmental policy in religious freedom sphere. And what seems to be the most important between problems in this realm is the incompleteness of political reform and paralysis of the Ukrainian parliament caused caused by the tiny margin between ruling coalition and opposition. Previous parliament, Ukrainian parliament of fifth convocation, did not manage to pass a single normative act in the interest of further harmonization of church-state relations. But it managed to reject as many as four respective bills, two bills of granting religious organizations the right to permanent use of landlords, and a bill of introducing a moratorium on privatization of property intended for religious purposes. As a result of a parliament crisis, the church state law adopted in the late Soviet time is still in force in Ukraine. Uh, I should admit that this law 
is not the worst one. This law uh, adopted in April 1991, several months before the collapse of the USSR, mainly follows the stipulation of the uh, Universal Declaration on Human Rights, the European Convention on Human Rights, as well as other European Convention. In many aspects, the Ukrainian model of church-state relation turned out to be more similar to American models than to European ones. The Ukrainian model includes the principle of church-state non-establishment, the strict separation of church from the state and state from church, equality, equality of all the religious uh, before the law. Unlike uh, overwhelming majority post-Soviet and post-communist uh, countries, uh, the Ukrainian legislation does not establish differences in the legal status of religious organization of different confession, does not create a division of the religious organization on the basis of traditional and non-traditional ones, does not establish any trial period for a religious community to obtain the status of legal entity, does not limit the right to create a religious organization to the citizen of Ukraine, and does not provide that only Ukrainian citizens can be leaders of the church. At the same time, Ukrainian law is absolutely obsolete. It was once again adopted four months before Ukrainian independence in the time of absolutely different legal, economical, and political realities. To put the point very simply, I can say that this law is unable to regulate important spheres of church-state relations, especially property issues. As experts argue, all restitutional decrees, especially uh, all uh, uh, decrees of returning church property, of the president and government regulation on the basis on which uh, property is returned to the church are openly illegitimate. They are all passed with open abuse of authority because the legal order of ownership is established exclusively by the laws of Ukraine, according to the uh, Ukrainian constitution. Uh, in 2005, Council of Europe has reminded Ukraine of the need for serious change of the uh, 1991 law in the area of freedom of religious expression. More recently, last year, in uh, July 2007, the European Court of Human Rights directly explained in the matter St. Michael Parish versus Ukraine, by the way, won by Ukraine, that the Ukrainian law on freedom of religious expression lacks consistency and predictability, and that that legislative shortcoming became an open obstacle in the way to passing lawful decision by Ukrainian courts. In particular, the European Court of Human Rights specifically stressed the in compliance of Article 7 and 8 of the Ukrainian law with the requirements of the European Convention on Protection of Human Rights and Basic Freedoms. And what is the, what is the role of uh, the United States international religious policy uh, in Ukraine? Uh, during preparation, but uh, since 1999, uh, the International Religious Freedom Report routinely points that uh, quotation. The Ukrainian Constitution and the law on freedom of conscience provide the freedom of religion and the government generally respected this right in practice. However, there were isolated problems at the local level due to local officials taking sides in disputes between religious organization, full stop. So Ukraine is not Sudan or North Korea. And what is the, uh, what is the role of uh, United States religious freedom law and annual report? Uh, so doing uh, preparation uh, to this symposium, I interviewed uh, 22 persons. It's not, I know, impressive data for sociologists. Uh, 
but among uh, this interviewee, official who has run governmental body on religious affairs during eight years. Unbelievable term for post-communist Ukraine. Uh, another official who has been counselor on religious matters to President Yushchenko for, ten, for two and a half years, and now is a head of Committee for Nationality and Religious Matters. Hierarchs of the mainstream church, civil society activists, ministries uh, of religious uh, uh, minority groups, regional officials responsible for church state affairs in respective regions, theologians, and so on. Uh, some persons interviewed criticized reports for instances of inaccuracy. Uh, some of them pointed out that reports make, uh, makes just a momentary picture instead of deep analysis. Archbishop Augustine of uh, Ukrainian Orthodox Church of Moscow Patriarchate noted uh, that reports are extremely sensitive to religious minorities and oversees all the subtleties within new religious movement, but overlooks the problems of mainstream church. Some respondents have mentioned that reports sometimes are too focused over an anti-Semitism anti sentiments and acts, while in their opinion, anti-Semitism is a particular phenomenon and should be considered separately. However, integral evaluation of International Religious Freedom Report appeared to be rather high. The interview emphasized that First, IRF report creates a sort of marketplace uh, for discussion over religious freedom issues. Second, IRF designs many-sided picture of religious freedom landscape where state official source merge with church uh, religion marginals ones and finally forms a new quality of analysis. Third, annual report becomes an information occasion for media, which normally are reluctant to religious freedom issues. Next, report mobilizes a public attention to religious freedom violation and forces authorities at least paid attention to such an instances. Is there any countable evidence which prove changes in perception of religious freedom issue in Ukrainian public sphere? Uh, a recent opinion poll, I mean 2007, showed that level of religious and confessional tolerance didn't change much in 2000, between 2000 and 2007. As before, the public consciousness is dominated by opinion, just 30 seconds, uh, that any religion proclaimed ideals of virtue, love, mercy, and not threatening the life of other people has a right to exist. And another opinion dominating all religions have a right to exist as different roads to God. In 2007, as well as in 2000, two thirds of respondents are sure that Ukraine shows absolute freedom of conscience and equality of confession before the law. Meanwhile, the number of those agreed that freedom of conscience and equality of confession in Ukraine are declared but not guaranteed, somewhat declined. From 38% in 2000 to 30% in 2000 in last year. What deserves attention is that among those people who consider themselves as believers, the share of those who agreed that Ukraine shows absolute freedom of conscience and the quality confession before the law increased from 66% to 72%. By contrast, the number of those who agree that freedom of conscience is declared but not guaranteed fell from 41% to 31%. A notable rise from a notable rise from uh, 36% to 46% was recorded in the number of people who agree that separation of the church from the state and of school 
from the church is prerequisite of a democratic state and guarantee of personal right to the freedom of conscience. So I afraid of Lori. That is why I, I conclude that uh, I'm far from perception uh, that all these are result of United of the United States uh, religious freedom abroad policy. However, among different factors, actors, and heroes who contributed to this, we should list 1998 Act. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate the chance to be here today, and I want to speak on behalf of uh, the other religious and NGO actors that, that helped produce this legislation. It didn't just start in 1996 or 1998. There were people who were active in monitoring religious freedom issues and persecution issues uh, throughout the communist world and in other parts of the world beginning with the end of the Second World War. And there were a number of different groups. There were religious organizations concerned about their own adherence. There were other kinds of NGO groups. Uh, I was the um, was a board member on a group called Creed that was actually set up with help from uh, various congressmen and senators to monitor the conditions of uh, Soviet prisoners of conscience, particularly religious prisoners of conscience. And of course, you had the whole movement, uh, the Union of Councils for Soviet Jewry that led to the massive exodus of, of Jews from the Soviet Union under the Jackson Vanek Amendment. So that had all gone on, and then I would say that in the 1990s, as we saw the collapse of the Soviet Union, we had a rather unique opportunity to be involved and to influence uh, both the beginnings of religious freedom in, in countries that had had 80% uh, adherence to atheism because that was the only choice they had, and, and massive persecution and elimination of religious groups toward a more pluralistic society, and then the experience of, of uh, some people wanting to go back. And I, I would disagree a little bit with uh, Jose Casanova in terms of the motivation. Yes, there's a sense in which uh, a country like Russia did have a historic um, Russian Orthodox past, but at the time that uh, organizations became free to practice their faith, it was completely a captive and a leftover remnant of a, of a state-controlled church. And unfortunately, it was used as a way to foment nationalism and, and support a more um, totalitarian political process, which we're seeing the fruits of now. Um, in terms of, of the impact of URFA, um, I'd like to say that as somebody that was involved with it, I've been really uh, happily surprised at the impact of setting up an office in the Department of State and uh, of having the commission as an outside regulatory body. I think that a lot of very positive things have happened. There's a place for people to go to with information. The State Department is now collecting information internationally uh, and putting it into these reports and is able to some extent certainly at the nation level, to, to be involved in, in interactions on particular situations of discrimination or persecution. Um, there are serious people working in the world, I mean, on the issue, sorry, uh, throughout the world, and um, there, there is a, a real sense that this issue is becoming front and center. And I don't think that it's... Uh, uh, problem that, that religion and religious freedom have come to the fore because it is a, an issue like slavery or the empowerment of women that, that is a unique problem and therefore has to be dealt with uniquely. Um, the, the negative that I see is that as our monitoring of religious freedom has increased and, and we're, we're doing more about it in the world as a whole, uh, conditions are deteriorating. There are uh, countries like Russia that, uh, just like Ukraine, had, had moved into a, a place of a, a much more positive uh, attitude towards regulating religious organizations. 
are moving backwards. In China, it's kind of in and out. Sometimes things seem better. Sometimes things seem worse. And then, of course, we have the rise of radical Islam and uh, all of the concomitant factors that are, that are leading to greater um, restrictions on religious freedom in many countries than ever existed in uh, prior decades. So uh, we have to see that there's still a tremendous amount of work to do. And um, another negative is that as the government has institutionalized these uh, two bodies which monitor religious freedom issues throughout the world, the NGO community, which was really the, the source of a lot of, uh, of this legislation and of the movement that created it, is as fragmented as ever and as underfunded as ever. And uh, as, as Paul just mentioned in his comments, I think it's very important that there be other actors besides governments and besides interaction at the diplomatic level to bring about change because we're talking about changing the laws of sovereign nations. And just as it takes us a long time to develop a new public policy and turn it into law, witness the healthcare debate, changing a country's approach towards regulating religious organizations and matters of faith is also a long-term process. And it has to involve lawyers, it has to involve policymakers, it has to involve politicians on the country level um, as well as here because we have lots of good ideas but we can't make them happen in other countries uh, unilaterally. And um, that goes to a point that was a great concern of mine, uh, particularly uh, at the time they were considering uh, the Wolf Specter Bill in Congress, which was what will the impact of this legislation be on the countries that we're trying to help and particularly the people that we're trying to help in country? Are we creating a kind of star chamber proceeding where we will gather data, we will be the judge, we will be the jury, and we will just come out with a report uh, and the, the other governments, the uh, religious groups in other countries will not have an opportunity to have any input. And that, has, that concern has been lessened to a large extent because of the practice at the State Department in the Office on Religious Freedom of soliciting input from foreign countries, from uh, ambassadors here in Washington. But I think that um, it could be better. And, Echoing, uh, <laughs> echoing uh, Victor's comments. You, it, it's all right. You can just. Um, there, there is a certain hostility that I have encountered among foreign governments towards the entire process. They bristle when they talk about the reports because they feel that often. Uh, subtle differences are ignored, that, that there's an emphasis on problems and not on the good side of what different governments are doing. And of course, there are these dramatic differences in, in, in the views of other countries in terms of what amount of religious freedom is appropriate, what groups should be allowed to operate. Um, and I think that we could probably go a long way in the future towards diffusing that kind of negativity on the part of foreign governments by having more interaction, as Paul suggests, and, um, and finding a way, particularly, I, I think, with the commission of bringing foreign governments into the process and, bring, and giving them a way to provide information. We found, I was discussing with someone um, in Russia, as some but probably most of you don't know, uh, in the early 1990s, there were, there were was this uh, Soviet period law that became effective that was really very good and allowed all sorts of religious organizations to register and exist and buy buildings and hold services and, and do all sorts of things that they hadn't been able to do through most of the Soviet period. Um, and then there was a, a reaction and they wanted to, uh, to restrict it. It started in 1993, came up again in 1997, and those events actually played a big role in the passage of URFA because we had bipartisan coalitions. We had letters written by the entire congressional leadership to President Boris Yeltsin. And we started to, to bring up a pretty big grassroots movement around 
these issues. But the, the thing that really made things positive in the 1997-1998 period was a, was a series of meetings with Russian government leaders where we hammered out what were the real problems with the 1997 law and showed them that there were only really three or four key issues. And they ended up resolving those issues through the regulatory process. Unfortunately, as a lawyer, they were not following the rule of law because they made the law do things that it didn't actually say, but it did preserve religious freedom in Russia for, um, well, really continuing to date um, in spite of all of the, the negative pressures. Um, in, in terms of, of our future, and this, this came up uh, last week at a commission hearing on Iran and I think is um, going to continue to, to come up, um, the United States is not going to be able to carry this banner alone. We can't be the only nation in the world that's promulgating international religious freedom. We've got to find a way to go back to the UN and uh, other multilateral bodies and persuade other countries to join us in this process. Uh, we need to get the UN and the signatories to documents like the, uh, the Declaration on Human Rights to, <laughs> you see, uh, to uh, tell us why they're not adhering to them, why they're completely ignoring them. Uh, and uh, we, we need to um, also really give a lot of scrutiny to uh, this issue of the twin tolerations, um, which Tom Farr talks about quite eloquently. Uh, uh, Pointing someone else, but has, has really put some real legs on that concept for me, which is that we've got religious freedom on the one hand, but we've got toleration and uh, coexistence on the other hand. And we can't give religious freedom to groups that want to take that freedom away from everybody else. Uh, we can't treat groups that want to execute people who, within their faith traditions, decide to change or uh, kill people who are not members of their own particular faith tradition uh, the same rights as other citizens to speak and to act on their beliefs. Uh, so that, that's something I think we really need to pay attention to. And I think the best way we can do it is by having bodies within our government that relate to, uh, to other governments and to multilateral bodies. Don't forget the Helsinki Accords, which were very powerful factors based in large part on religious persecution and the former Soviet Union that were multilateral that, that helped uh, lead to the changes that we saw in the 1990s. And uh, I think I'll stop with that. And thank you for your attention. OK, we want to get some questions uh, for our panel. Uh, I'm Sunni, a professor of the Catholic University of America. Uh, I have some comments and one question for Dr. Liu Pen. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I did a study on the persecution, uh, religious persecution in China. So I have deep concern about the, the way the communist regime treat the religious belief in China. Uh, you know that <coughs> uh, the annual human rights report last year by State Department uh, designated China again uh, as a, one of the CPC. It mentioned that uh, there are more than 200,000 people in, ch in jail and more than half of that are Falun Gong practitioner. And uh, based on the reliable source that there were 173 practitioner of Falun Gong were tortured to death last year in 2007 uh, <clears throat> under the police custody. And, uh, <clears throat> and last week. So, so now what, what is your question? Yeah, last week. Uh, well, yeah, last, uh, OK. My question is. Uh, uh, we, we heard you that you asked the U.S. government to give more tolerance to communist regime. Uh, I want, my question is, can you, when you go back, ask the leader of communist regime 
to give uh, more tolerance to Chinese people, particularly a religious believer, be it a Falun Gong practitioner or Christian of underground church or Tibetan Buddhism. Can you do that? Uh, I have to uh, clarify a little bit about uh, you know, the question you ask. Uh, you are talking uh, the issue of uh, Falun Gong. Uh, as I say, uh, Chinese government already made a clear statement about what is uh, religion, what is uh, Falun Gong. Falun Gong in China is not considered as a uh, religion or a religious group. Uh, of course, we can uh, argue whether Falun Gong is a religion or not because we don't have a term faith-based organization like you do here in the US. So you really don't make a, a definition what is a religion, what is not. But in China, we have a simply um, uh, decide uh, five religions, <clears throat> the Buddhism, Taoism, Islam, and Protestant, and the Roman Catholic uh, religion. And besides this, uh, may not be included. Some religion, like uh, Orthodox or uh, Mormons or uh, Baha'i uh, or Jewish, they do ask for recognition. Uh, government uh, knows them, but whether government will give them recognition or not is, um, is a different consideration. However, government does think they are religion. For Falun Gong, <laughs> that's a Total different. Government even doesn't think Falun Gong is a religion. So whenever you talk Falun Gong, Falun Gong is out of <clears throat> the issue of religion. So religion bureau or or uh, government so agents don't take religion as a religion issue. That's uh, the one thing I want to say. As I said, and uh, here you you make a very broadly or widely definition on the faith-based organization. But in China, we, when we talk the religion, mainly we talk the five religions. Uh, okay, so the Falun Gong is out of that kind of uh, region. Second, the tolerance I ask is not US government tolerance, uh, uh, China is tolerance me. I mean, so, uh, if I say something on the US government, I don't want to say, oh, uh, I'm talking something interfere with uh, US or Americans inter, uh, internal affairs. I don't want to say that way because I'm talking something about uh, your policy. For China, I don't think uh, government will collect the uh, opinion uh, this way because we don't have a, um, the mechanism as you do here. It's uh, different. We do have a conference we can give a suggestion or uh, uh, our understanding about the religion or church state separation or religion freedom or how to play the role for the religion group in the society. Government may or may not want to take it, uh, but you do have a right to talk this in the conference. I think that is the way. In fact, I have published a book. I uh, had a conference. I talked with government leaders all the time. So they all know my opinion or idea. So it, there is no such issue whether I can talk this in China or not. It's just the issue in, the, in what kind of degree government we are decided we should make some change on some things. People talk many, many things. It's just a, a matter when we want to make a reform or change on what kind of uh, region or policy I think that is. Now, for the Falun Gong issues, uh, uh, I really uh, apologize. I'm not a uh, specialist uh, or expert on that kind of issue. I do have a, um, a specialties on the religion, especially in the US and the US-China relations. Okay, okay. maybe Thank not you. satisfy you. <laughs> Thank you. Another question, uh, yes, the young lady. Um, Marina Putiano from Co Georgetown College. I would like to go back to last year's parliamentary campaign in Ukraine and former candidate and current Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko, who during the campaign seemed to play the religious card quite well. And I was wondering if this 
promotion of Christian Orthodox values would somehow affect the fragile balance of the, between the different religious denominations and compromise the concept of separation between state and church in Ukraine. Thank you. Um, first of all, uh, parliamentary election occurs so often in Ukraine that I confuse in which one the religious card plays more actively. Uh, but to take uh, this seriously, uh, religious, religious card or religious factor uh, takes place in all campaign, parliamentary and presidential campaign in Ukraine. Especially as I, as I, as I uh, mentioned, during the 2004 uh, presidential campaign. It need more, more wider uh, answer because it was clash of two discourses. Discourses of governmental candidate who uh, performed himself as a uh, protector of true Orthodox Church, canonical church, what means under the auspice of Moscow Patriarchate. He uh, appeared in TV screens, in uh, papers as a, as a protector, as a uh, Byzantine style imperial, merciless to, to enemies, and uh, uh, very, very, uh, very prone to protect uh, Moscow Patriarchate and very humble before the icon and so on. And uh, another discourse uh, uh, then candidate uh, to president Yushchenko, who uh, presents uh, little Ukrainians uh, uh, discourse, uh, and uh, he emphasized over the all, all uh, uh, religious values, but not exclusively about the canonical or non-canonical uh, 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 Orthodox, Orthodox Church. Now, as I mentioned, all uh, fragment of all strata of uh, r political elite address, address uh, to, to uh, particular uh, strata in religious landscape. But what is impossible, for example, in Russia, in uh, all parties, uh, there are Orthodox, Catholic uh, believers, and what absolutely unbelievable for Russia, for example, the first vice president is in Ukraine is evangelical. It's hardly to, to, to imagine for, 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 for Russia, for example. And uh, once more, uh, religious landscape in Ukraine uh, very, very diverse. And uh, Ukrainian politic politicians, of course, of course, try uh, try to uh, to use uh, instrumentally sometimes uh, uh, this diversity. Thank you. And um, as uh, we do here. Uh, the uh, one clarification: the the Orthodox Church in Ukraine is obviously has is not a monolith. There's various patriarchates, and they compete for the sentiments of the people. And some are aligned with Moscow, and others more with the nationalist movement in Ukraine. I think we had another question yes. over here. Last, this is our last question. Uh, you mentioned that there is no partners at the level of the Ministry of Foreign. Uh, uh, relations to discuss issues of religion, but as you know, last week the Minister of Religious Affairs, the Chinese minister, was here at Georgetown to sign an agreement with Georgetown University, looking for a partner very different from a government partner. Uh, would you like to comment on uh, what is your reading of this relation between the Ministry of religious affairs in China and Georgetown University to advance issues of the study of religion and religious freedom. Um, and then I have a question to what I comment actually about the, China, the Ukraine and Russia difference, main difference. I think I was misunderstood when I said what I said about Russia. Actually, precisely because the Orthodox churches have 
come out so weakened by the uh, uh, communist period control. They very much felt uh, threatened by external uh, 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 evangelical preachers. I mean, let's look at Bulgaria. There are more evangelical ministers coming from abroad in Bulgaria today than priests within the Bulgarian Orthodox Church. And of course, there is then a sense in which these churches feel the need to look for protection from the state. I'm not saying that this is good, and I'm not saying that the state uh, uh, actually likes to, again, enter this pact. What is interesting about Ukraine, actually, is not only that you have an evangelical measure of Kiev, the, the capital, but it actually, in every religious group in Ukraine, whether evangelical, I mean, uh, Baptists, Pentecostals, Muslims, Asian groups, <coughs> and most Orthodox groups, of course, but also the Greek Catholics. The majority of religious leaders are Ukrainian. Only Roman Catholics and Jews have a slight majority of foreign uh, religious leaders. So it is the way in which all religions have, been, have become indigenous to Ukraine, and they have an internal process of development that distinguishes very much Ukraine from, from Russia in this respect, and you cannot call these religions foreign religions or non-traditional religions because all their leaders are actually Ukrainian. And, and so this, I think, is a very, very important point. Okay, so, so I, I, do we, we just have the one question. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm very glad to hear the, the progress <coughs> uh, Georgetown University made uh, with... Uh, Chinese, um, oh, so how to say, Sarah, uh, State Authority of Religion Affairs Bureau, or uh, a short way, and uh, Religion Affairs Bureau. I personally uh, very much encouraged uh, this kind of uh, progress because it will give a chance for both sides to have a better understanding. However, uh, Sarah, our State uh, Authority of Religion and Affairs Bureau, doesn't have a rights to deal with U.S. government. In other words, Foreign Affairs Ministry of China is doing uh, diplomatic uh, work with U.S. officially. Anything U.S. want to talk with China has to talk with the Foreign Affairs Ministry first or only. If this is something this ministry or this department need to forward to some other office, it could. But Sarah cannot deal with State Department here without Foreign Affairs Ministry. In other words, they, this is not their job. They are pure domestic departments, only deal with the home issue not international issue, not uh, diplomatic issue, not uh, dialogue with foreigners. For the uh, events or activities here with Georgetown, it can be considered as a, a progress or result for the SARA build relation with some uh, non-government uh, institution or uh, organization or schools. In China, many, many government agents, they want to build relations with academic schools here to train their staff employer to learn something. Uh, they want to build a relation with Harvard, Yale, Columbia, Georgetown, all these um, uh, distinguished uh, famous schools. But never means they are dealing with the uh, US government never means they have a right to deal with U.S. government uh, be, uh, without foreign ministries. So this is uh, different. If Georgetown is not U.S. government representative, so you can say this is academic uh, relations. For Chinese, any Chinese government agents to build a relation with academic school, I think this is uh, very good. But mainly, Foreign Affairs Ministry is doing diplomatic work instead of other government agents, especially for those who are in charge of domestic issues. So that's my understanding. So the result is pretty good. But the relations, you have to think that it's a 
total different. It's not on the equal or same uh, uh, talking between different uh, partners. Okay, well, our time is up, and we want to thank the panel for their uh, comments. <laughs>